Arratxaldeon eta ongi etorririk beroena, gaur Arratxalde euritsu honetan, Donostiako udaletxeko pleno aretoan bildu zareten guztioi. Donostiako udalaren txat, benetan, benetan plazer gata, eguraldi, eguraldi, zuek hemen izatea. Eta Donostiako Euskara zinegotzi naizen enean, alkatearen izenean eta korporazio osoaren izenean ongi etorri beroena eman nahi dizuet. Oso harro gaude ez udalean bakarrik nik esango nuke unibertsitatean eta euskal gizartea osatzen dugun asko behintzat uikilarien elkartea izatearekin eta uikilarien elkarteak egiten duen lanarekin. Ez dakik dakizuen, baina guk behin baino gehiagotan esaten dugu, Wikipedian, beraz, interneten, Euskarak zenbaterainoko presentzia duen ikusita, zenbat jende dugun Wikilari aktibo eta prestu, edukiak osatzeko eta edukiak lantzeko prest daudenak, Euskarak ziurrenik munduan, izkuntzen artean duen lekua baino askoz presentzia haundiagoa du proportzioan interneten eta Wikipedian. Eta hori hemen zaudeten batzuen lanari esker da. 2006an Donostia Kultura Iriburu izan zen, and now I'm going to talk, to speak a little in English. First of all, welcome, the warmest welcome to San Sebastian and to this uh, plenary room of the uh, town hall. Uh, I was starting to say that in 2016, Donostia was the capital of culture in Europe. And uh, one of the projects was Donostia Pedia. Uh, it was an attempt to attract people who were ready to enrich the content of uh, Wikipedia um, inserting articles about Donostia, trying to do small pieces of research and uh, putting there things not so well known about Donostia. So it was a way of uh, encouraging the participation of uh, people, a way of uh, saying to our citizens that a project such as the uh, Capital of Culture is not just an institutional project, it's a project of each and every citizen, and each one has something to give. So, 2016 passed, and uh, we thought that this had been a really um, a nice experience, a nice experience worth to be continued. So, we came up with the project of Idas Le Sanyak, you will have, uh, I think, a talk about that perhaps tomorrow or on Sunday, I'm not sure, but uh, you'll uh, uh, hear something about Idas Le Sanyak that can be translated as um, writer guards. It's a project participated by uh, ACA, the Association of Writers and Translators of Basque Language, Wikilarien El Cartea, and uh, the library of uh, San Sebastian are librarians working in San Sebastian. And the aim is, again, enrich uh, the content of Wikipedia in certain information about our Basque writers. And uh, we would like that uh, this uh, information would be useful also for education, for teachers, uh, for us high school, for secondary education, and why not also uh, for students at university, perhaps not exactly in literature or in linguistics, but in, in other uh, fields of study. Uh, so we see that uh, besides um, welcoming you and being happy and proud of having you here working with us uh, for the next uh, two days, uh, we also worry about uh, Wikipedia, about its content, and when I'm saying Wikipedia. 
and uh, Isha Taldea, uh, this group of uh, research we have at the university, and uh, so many other people. And we also encourage our students at the university to enrich the content in uh, Wikipedia, writing uh, articles about, uh, right now I'm teaching uh, stuff related with Basque and uh, law and things like that, and uh, encouraging them uh, to write articles about uh, different concepts uh, used in, um, in the, uh, this uh, field of uh, uh, the, the criminology and uh, uh, legal uh, terms uh, so that uh, other students and uh, even the uh, classmates can be, uh, can consult all that information in Basque. Beraz, eh, eskerrik asko, donostian egoteagatik, eskerrik asko batez ere, egingo duzuen lanarekin gatik, eta utziko diguzuen informazio eta irakaskuntza guztiaren gatik. And I would, before finishing, uh, say a great thank you to our keynote speaker and to the rest of keynote speakers uh, that tomorrow and on Sunday uh, will give us really an important information to think about and to learn about. Eskerrikasko. Jaun Andreok, eh, arratzaldeon guztioi, eta ongi etorririk beroena, bereziki, kanpotik Euskal Herrira heldu zareten guztioi. Ekitaldi hau, zuen interesekoa izatea, opadizuet, eta espero dut, egunotan, lan jardunak edukiz beteak izatea, eta aberazgarriak denontzat. Gure eskerrik beroena, eman nahi diot, Wikimedia Fundazioari, ekitaldi hau antolatzen laguntzeagatik, eskerrik asko. Eta eskermela Euskal Wikilarien elkarteari Wikimedia eta Hezkuntza izeneko konferentzia honen idea edukitzeagatik eta beronen antolaketa zuen gain hartzeagatik. Eskerrik asko. Emezortzigarren mendean, politikaren eta kulturaren ikuspegitik Europa osoan garrantzi handia hartu zuen ekimen bat sortu zen. Entziklopedismoa. Elburu nagusi bat zuen, munduan zegoen jakinduria biltzea, eta herritarrei eskaintzea. Frantzian, la enciclopedia ou dictionnaire raisonné des sciences, des arts et des métiers izan zen enciklopedismoaren neurri paradigmatikoa. Eta bere elburu nagusiak izan ziren alde batetik ilustrazioaren ideiak Europan zabaltzea eta bestetik iluntasunari eta ez jakintasunari aurre egitea. Enziklopedia hura liburuki marduletan argitaratu zen, eta bere edukien erredakzioan garai hartako pentsalaririk entzutetxeruenetako batzuk lagundu zuten, tartean ziran Voltaire, Ozo edo Montesquieu. Gizon jantzi eta jakintxu haietako batzuk Euskal Herria, Euskararen Herria ezagutzeko aukera izan zuten, eta guganaino heldu dira, gure herriaz idatzi zituzten iritzi erromantiko eta apologistak. Guzok esan zuen, Gernika, Euskal Herrian dagoen irizonatua, Gernika munduko herririk zori ontzuena da. Hango aferrak baserritarren batzar batek gobernatzen ditu. Aritz baten pean biltzen dira, eta ebazpenik zuzenenak hartzen dituzte beti. Ezaguna da baita ere Volterrek Euskaldunei buruz egin zuen definizioa. Pirineoetako magalean dantzan egiten duen herri hori. Bi mende baino gehiago igaro dira iritzi hoiek idatzi eta utzi zituztenetik. Eta mundua, munduaren inguruko jakinduria, entziklopediak eta noski Euskararen herria, zearo aldatu dira arrezkeroztik. Jakinduria demokratizatu eta zabaldu egin da, eta interneterako konexioa edo zarbidea daukan edonork, diderotek nekez imagina zezakeen jakinduria eskura dauka klik batera. 
Munduan gehien irakurtzen den entziklopedia hori gaur digitala da. Wikipedia deitzen da. Eta Frantziako pentsalari entzutetsuenek beharrean mundu, mundu osoko <coughs> mundu osoko herritarrek egiten dute irureun dabi hizkuntzatan. Pirineoen magalean hain perfektua ez den Gernikako demokrazia hura zabaldu eta orokortu eginda. Eta oraindik ere perfektua ez den arren, Euskal Herritarrek hautzat, hautatzen dituzte aritzaren pean elkartzen diren batzar gizon emakumeak. Eta eraberean, Euskararen herriko eunka gazte Euskaldunek munduak gehien irakurtzen den entziklopedia hori idazten laguntzen dute. Ousok eta Voltaireak egin zuten moduan. Eta hain dira saiatuak euskeraz egiten den Wikipedia hori hogeita bederatzi garren postura iritsi dela artikulu kopuruari dagokionez munduko hizkuntzen artean. Euskal Herritarrek egunero egunero euskaraz idatzitako hirurogeita hamar mila artikulu baino gehiago kontsultatzen dituzte. Eta hogeita bat garren mendiko entziklopedia hori edabide gehienak baino gehiago kontsumitzen dute gure gazteek. Gernikako mutilaien ondorengoek musika entzuteko YouTube edo Spotify aukeratzen dute. Eta zinea mundu mailako plataformen bitartez kontsumitzen dute. Etengabe aldaketa arinean dagoen mundu harrigarri bezain liluragarri batean gaude. Eta datorrenaren aurrean, hobe dugu zezenari adarretatik eltzea, eta datorrena erronka bezala eta aukera bezala ikustea. Euskarazko Wikipediaren arrakasta hau etzen posible izango aurretik beste apostu batzuk egin ezbalida. Orain dela eun urte, mila bederatzireun da emeretzian, Euskaltzen dia sortu zen, Euskararen Akademia. Berrogeita amar urte geroago, mila bederatzireun de irurogeita sortzian, Euskara batua etorri zen, akademiek eta idazleek bultzatuta. Euskararen etorkizunari kemenez eta indarrez aurre egitekotan, bidegile haiek argi ikusi zuten, haoz erabiltzen genituen euskalkien edo dialektuekin batera, Izkuntza eredu estandar bat behar genuela idatzirako eta jendaurreko komunikaziorako. Gure izkuntzari eta kulturari arnaz berria ematekotan. Horrela sortu zen gure eredu estandarra edo euskara batua. Sarrutan, sarritan, galdetu diot neure buruari, zer izango litzatekeen adibidez euskarazko Wikipedia euskararen batasunik izan ezpalitz. Ziurrenik, utzaren urrengoa. Hogeita bat garren mendera, baldintza hauetan heldu bagara, izan da aurrekoek bidea asmatzeko gai izan zirelako. Eta hortxe daukagu, hain zuzen ere, gaur egungo erronka. Berriz ere, asmatzea. Gizarte aurreratu, moderno, jantzi eta solidarioa eraiki dugu Euskal Herrian. Eta gure kulturari eusteko apustua egin dugu. Beti ere, etxeko atea eta etxeko lehioak zabal-zabalik dauzkagula. Leio hoietatik ikusten dugu nondik eta nora doan mundu berri eta aldako rau, eta aurrean ditugun erronkak ere ikusten ditugu. Euskarazko Wikipediak erakutsi digun moduan, inteligentziaz eta talentuz jokatzen badugu, erronka hoiek aukera bihurtu daitezke. Wikipediak gaur lehen entziklopediek izan zuten helburu bera du. Munduan dagoen jakinduria biltzea, eta eskura gai jartzea. Gure kasuan gainera, Euskaldun honi izkuntzan, Euskal Herriko izkuntzan erakustea informazio hori. Eta informazio iturri fidagarria izan nahi dugu Wikipediak. Ez jakintasunaren aurkako tresna indartzua eta kultura demokratizatzeko lanabez zorrotza. Eskerronez, Agur eta ongi etorri da noi, eta aurrean dezkatzuen egunak emankorrak izan daitezela. Eskarrik asko. Eskerrik asko, guztioi ona etortzea gatik, eta 
aurbero da guzti hoi, ez da? Eta, bueno, eskerrik asko urrutitik etorri zareten hoi, eta eskerrik asko baita ere, ba, hau guztia posible egin duzuen erakundi hoi baita ere, ba, bai Donostiako udalari eta bai Eusko Jarraritzari. Eta, bueno, eta baita ere, ba, bueno, nola ez, ba, nere elkarteko kidei, ba, bueno, lan haundia egin duzu, ez da, udan erantolatzen, eta, bueno, ba, bueno, ez dakit, bueno, lehen da bizia sikonez, bueno, bat, ez dauten ez dauten ez dauten, ba, bueno, ni nahiz elkarte aguantolatu den elkartearen lehen dakaria, ez besterik gabe. Bueno, elkarte hau, ba, bueno, sortu zen, 2006an, ba, bueno, 2006an, barkatu, 2006an, ba, ikusi dik, ba, bueno, ba, ukipide hau, 2008an abilatutako ukipide hau, ba, bueno, ba, pixka bat, aurrera egiteko, ba, beste gutza baten beharrean zela, ez? Ba, 2008an abilatu zen, eta 2008an, ja, dagoeneko 1000 artikulu zituen, berroita bigarrena zen horre ukipide aguztien artean, ez da, eta, bueno, berroita bigarrena zer esan nahi du horrek, ba, bueno, ba, izkuntza guztien artean, behar bada, munduko izkuntza guztien artean, berreun garren postuaren bueltan ibiliko da Euskara, ba, bueno, zaila da esatea, ez, zehazki ze postutan ibiliko den, baina, bueno, berreun garren postu hortatik, zera, izkuntza, horre, izkuntza honek dituen izkuntko puruaren aldetik, berreun garren postuan da bien izkuntza honek, ba, berreuita bigarren postua zeukan, ez, gukipe den artean, ba, ez da gutxi, ez, hor, ezkenean, Egia da, Euskara ez dela izkuntza txikia, ez da izkuntza txikia, zer eta badakigu zazpin bila izkuntza direla, eta akika monerrizek erakutsik zigunez, ba, euneko amar, goreneko euneko amarrean dago, ez, gure izkuntza, ez, hor, ez da, zazpin bila berren garrena izatea ez da gutxi, hor, hor, berren garren edo, bueno, ez da kite, gutxi gara bera, ze, Ez dago dautu figadarrerik, ez horre, ze postu dan, ez? Lehenengoek eta garri daukate, baina, ja, egun garren postutik atzea, ja, zai da, ez? Esatea, zai da. Eta, bueno, orduan kontua da, hori, ba, ikusten genuela, hor, kopuruz eta bazi joala horrera, hor, artikulu kopuruz horrera, zi joala, hor, ondo, zegokion tokian, bentsat, guk nahiko genukaren tokian bazegoela, ez? Artikulu kopuraren aldetik, baina erabiltzaileak pasiboak zirela, ez? Gehien bat, hor, Wikipedia kontu konsultatzera etortzen den jendea, baina ez hobetzera. Eta, bueno, hor, behar zen, hor, jauzi bat, ez? Hor, iztunak Wikilari aktibo bihurtu, ez? Editatzera sartu, ez? Eta horretan, ba, bueno, alegin horretan, ba, pentsatu genuen, hor, elkarte bat egitea eta pixkat gutza da tenbateko, ez? Horri, joera aktibo bat hartzeko, ez? Jarrera aktibo bat hartzeko jendeak, ez? Wikipedaren aurrean. Eta 2008an sortu zen, urtarrian, zortzik ide eginen, hasira hartan. Eta, bueno, lanaren poderioz, ba, bueno, pixkanaka, pixkanaka, gehiago, jende gehiago biltzen, hasi ginen. Eta, Eusko Jalaitzarekiko itzarmena oso ondo etorrez daigu, hor, hor, ikastetxeetan sartzeko, ez? Hor, eta benetan sartzeko, hor, hor, ikasleek, hor, tresnatzat hartzeko, ez? Hor, beren lana eta beraiek ikasitakoa Wikipedian txertatzen joateko, eta eduki zornitzeko, eta baita ere kalitate zornitzeko, ez? Hor, errei esatzeko, eta ze irakasleak gainean dituzte, eta hor duan, lortzen ari gara, hor, jarrera aktibo bat izatea, ez? Eusko Jalaitzarekin izan dugun itzarmen honi esker. Eta, bueno, orain, hori, gure elkarteak, hogeita maika kide ditu, dagoeneko. Eta, eta lehen, ba, bueno, ba, bimia eta marraren bueltan edo, hor, hola, wikilari aktiboak, balin bat ziren, ba, hilaren arabera, ba, hogeita marra iru hogei, orain zazpireun eta hogeita bi dira, ez? Hor, azkeneko hilabete honetan, zazpireun da hogeita bi, wikilari izan ditugu Wikipedia egitatzen. Eta bada zifra politia, ez? Eta, bueno, ba, bueno, hor arregin horretan jarretuko dugu, eta, bueno, espero dugu erakundetatik ere laguntza izango dugula horretan, eta, bueno, ba, horretan jarretuko dugu, eta zure laguntzarekin ere, ba, bueno, ba, hori, zure laguntzare espero dugu, eta eskerrik asko, guzti hori.
Hello, everyone. It's, it's so wonderful to see all of you here today. I know a lot of the faces in the room right now. Um, I want to say thank you to the Basque government and thank you to the Basque Comedians User Group for hosting this conference. Um, and I want to thank all of you for being here. I'm so excited over the next few days to hear more about your programs around the world and to talk more about the potential that Wikimedia and education has to change the way that people learn and to make knowledge more equitable for everyone. Today, I just want to make a quick announcement um, about an opportunity the education team at the Wikimedia Foundation is calling the Wikimedia Education Greenhouse. This is a project that will help you take your ideas for Wikimedia and education to life. You can find out more in some informal uh, presentations we're having tomorrow and Sunday. And you can also find out more if you go to education.wikimedia.org. Now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight, Mary Burns um, from the Education Development Center. Uh, Mary has brought technology into the classroom in countries all over the world. She is here to help us understand more about what teachers need in order to use new technologies in the classroom. So please join me in welcoming Mary to the stage. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, good evening. Um, I'm sorry I snuck off. On Wednesday I was in Australia and it's Friday and um, I'm really jet lagged <laughs> and all of a sudden it kicked in as I was sitting there. So my apologies ahead of time. And I also want to, excuse me, I also want to time myself because I'm the only thing standing between you and dinner uh, and this is not a good place to be. Oh, thank you. Um, so I, I'm going to give myself a very strict time schedule. Okay, I've started. Um, I want to thank Wikimedia for inviting me to this lovely city. Um, I'm a very enthusiastic user of your content. I want to thank the government of San Sebastian, the government of the Basque Country, for hosting this event. I think the work that you do is extraordinarily important. Excuse me. Um, before I start, I just wanted to know a little bit about where people are from. So who's from Spain? All right. And who's from the Basque Country in particular? All right. We have quite a lot of representation. Uh, all right. I'll be very broad. Asia? Um, so are you guys the Thai? Are you from Mahidon? Are you from Mahidon? Oh my god. I've worked at Mahidon. Um, and are you, and now Africa, where do we have, okay, all right, marhaba. And um, North America, anyone besides, there's a few of us here. Uh, South America, okay, we have Ecuadorians, right? All right, you vivi in Ecuador, in Cuenca. <laughs> see, see, all right, am I, what, what other, now how many of you work with teachers? All right, and how many of you are teachers? All right. And where are the wiki, are you all volunteers? Pretty much, most of you. All right, is there any profession? Those of you that work with teachers, are you working with, how many are working with primary school teachers? Very few. Secondary school teachers? That's what I figured. How about university people? Oh, a lot of you. All right, great. Um, so let me go on. I will tell you a little bit about myself. For the past 22 years, I have been doing professional development and working with technology with teachers. That means that I'm very old. Um, and most of my work is around uh, using technology to, I would say most of my work and most of my passion is around using technology to help teachers, is that me? Um, do something different, something that they can't normally do without technology. And that really is to promote higher level thinking, deep learning, among our students because as you know our students really need to be critical thinkers and deep learners in order to succeed at university in order to succeed in the world of work and in order to be good citizens so that is a big passion of mine and i would say that those elements of teacher education and professional development So those elements 
of, of teacher professional development and technology and digital content and deep learning are um, really some of the elements that I'll be talking about tonight. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I've told you a little bit about myself, but I'd actually like to learn a little more about you. So I'm going to ask you to think about something that you do really, really well an area in which you have expertise. All right, so think for a moment. Now, I want to ask you which of the following best helped you develop this expertise? I'm going to show you the answers in a minute, or Galder will. But first of all, if you have phones, and I assume most of you do, if you could take them out and go to, um, oops, what just happened, to Menti, Dot com, and if you type in the code 43583. So the responses, thank you. The responses that I've given you, they may not be exactly how you learn this expertise, but I've asked you, did you learn it by reading about it, through a lecture, through observation, through collaboration, by doing it, guided practice. So take a minute and vote. One person, one vote. No vote stuffing, no voter suppression. One person, one vote. And I'm going to give you about 30 more seconds, because if I take too long, you won't have dinner. All right, so our, our, our votes are coming in. We have 39, 40 people. Again, I'll give you about another 10 seconds or so, and then we'll stop, and then I'll move on. Is everybody, everyone voting? Everyone looks like they voted. All right, sounds good. Okay. Um, now, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to go and ask you to move on. I'm going to think about, ask you to think about the teachers that you work with. There you go. Um, now, this can be you, or this can be Wikimedia, or this can just be teacher professional development in, in general. But I want you to think about how is it that we help teachers develop their expertise? Is it mainly through demonstration, through lecture, through observation, through collaborating with others, through guided practice? Again, and, and this is kind of a dumb, what do, you, what do you mostly see in terms of working with teachers? Either you do it, or Wikimedia does it, or you just see it in teacher education in general. And again, about 10 more seconds. It looks like most of you are voting. You can only vote once, I hope. So I'm going to take us back, because we'll be going back and forth here for a second. So Galder, if you don't mind going to the previous slide for a second. Thank you. So let's talk about you and your learning. Um, so first of all, the way that I organized this was you see there's kind of two axes here. Um, the first three choices, reading about it, lecture, and observation, are really about information. And then the last three choices, collaborating with others, doing it, and guiding practice, are really about experiences. And it's really no surprise that for most of you, I would say almost all of you, you learn from experiences. You learn from collaborating with others. You basically learn, most of you, from doing it or you learn from some guidance pra guided practice. So let's go to the teachers for a second. Um, so this is a little bit interesting. Again, the same kind of axes, information versus experiences. And so it, it changes a little bit, but you're also more on the experience side, and that's actually great. You're saying that for the most part, the way that you work with teachers or you see uh, teacher education occurring is through this experience part, although we have some more on the kind of information side, demonstration, lecture, observation. So 
I'm going to ask you, God, then, if you don't mind closing this and going back to the PowerPoint for a sec. And then if you can go to the next slide. And then the next one. I'm oh, sorry, that's me, isn't it? <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so this is great, actually. I want to say a word about lectures um, because in my own experience working with teachers, most of what I see and most of what I see in the education system across the globe, and I'm gathering that you also see this as well, is that the primary means, the primary format for helping not only teachers learn a skill, but also students learn a skill, is still a lecture. Um, that seems to be shifting, and I think that's a good thing, and you seem to be indicating that that's certainly shifting in your work. But lectures are still a dominant form of helping people learn information and skills. And so what do I mean by a lecture? I mean a lecture is somebody like me standing in front of a group of people and telling them information. So it may be interactive, like I've tried to do. It may have visuals, like I'm trying to use. Um, there may be discussion, which I hope we're able to have. But it's still a very one-to-many form of transmitting information. Um, it's still very much predicated on the idea that if we give people information, they will automatically learn. And information is important, but what we know about lectures is they really do very little to help people learn. Um, what we know about lectures is that they're very, because of the, what we know about brain research and about learning, is that people retain very, very little from what they actually learn in a lecture. Lectures are very good for superficial learning. Um, so my point this evening is that I think if we're trying to help teachers or, or in our environments, if we see that people are trying to help teachers learn digital content, digital tools, and doing it through lecture, then we're really wasting both our time and we're wasting teachers' time. Um, before I conclude, I always like to say, make a joke about lectures, which is I consider them to be kind of the cockroaches of um, educational transmission of, of instruction. So, you know, they say a cockroach can survive a nuclear war. Um, so the lecture has survived through the century, war, death, governments, devastation. So this is the Sorbonne in 1342, and this is a U.S. classroom in 2019. And except for the clothes and the use of technology, they essentially are doing the same thing. Somebody's standing up there giving information. So lectures are great. Telling people like I'm doing now are great for superficial learning, but they're really poor formats for deep learning. And so what do I mean by deep learning? Deep learning is about relating new ideas and concepts to previous knowledge and experiences. It's about integrating that knowledge into interrelated conceptual systems. It's about identifying patterns and underlying principles. It's about evaluating new ideas and relating them to conclusions. It's about discussing and dialoguing to create new knowledge, critically examining the logic of an argument, and really reflecting on our own understanding and processes of learning. So deep learning is really about relating and integrating, identifying, evaluating, discussing and dialoguing, critically examining and reflecting. So one of the misconceptions that we have in teacher education, and perhaps you've encountered this as well, is this idea that if we teach teachers about the tools, about media, about technology, that they will automatically be able to use it in their own teaching. And we know that this really is not true. This is actually a fallacy. Um, and the teachers that you're working with, um, those of you who are primarily working with secondary education and then with university instructors, those teachers have really a very unique challenge because they have to take novice learners and really, through a process, turn them into experts, help them develop expertise. And expertise is characterized by deep learning. And I'm guessing, I think, I would actually say that you yourselves have a very unique challenge because you too have to take teachers 
who may be novices or beginners in terms of using digital content or using digital information, and you also have to turn them into experts, or at least people who are proficient with this, so that they can do the same with their students. And I think as you're seeing in terms of your own learning, we really can't do that through a lecture or by telling people. And I'm going to show you why. So Galdar, if you could go to the last. Um, so I'm gonna ask you one more time to take out your phones. Um, so if, by the way, if you fail this quiz, you can't have dinner. Did I mention that? Sorry. Um, so I gave you a mini lecture on deep learning. And now what I'd like to do is give you a quiz to see how well you learn that information through my mini lecture. So I want to ask you which of the following answers is correct? What is deep learning? So I'm going to stop us for a second. Anybody else want to vote? You can only vote once, I hope. This is like a horse race. So C and D are like neck and neck. Um, so, oh, now they're tied. <laughs> so who's going to win? Oh my god, now C is ahead. Um, so let me stop. And Galder, if you could show us the correct answer. You can just click show correct answer. If you click below. The correct answer is D. How many of you got D right? Okay, you guys can eat. The rest of you, sorry, no food for you. Um, so we just had a mini lecture. It was probably a very bad lecture, but you can see that from about half of us failed it. It's not because of you, it's just because of the way memory works. We don't retain information from being told something for very long. So, go back to the PowerPoint. Thank you. And back to... Oh, that's me, the next one. Um, so really, my message tonight is the title of this talk, and it's Beyond Information and Deep Learning with Digital Content. And I have a feeling I, I may be preaching to the choir a little bit, but the point is that information's important, and that's what Wikimedia does so well. Um, but information or content alone, though necessary, is not enough. What we really need to do is to give the teachers that we work with, especially, I would say, at the university level where folks aren't taught how to teach, we have to help them, to give them the kinds of learning experiences that you just said help you develop expertise. Practice, collaboration, doing things with other, doing things, um, we really have to set up tools for teachers. We really have to model for teachers good instructional practices using digital content and give them the instructional tools so that they can develop this deep learning with their own students. Because that's really what this is about. When you are working with teachers, your client is really those students. So in the rest of this presentation, I'm actually going to um, share two examples of ways that I think we might be able to do that in the short amount of time that I have. So um, right now, what I'd like to have you do in your row is to find either two other people or one other person to work with. So you have uneven rows. So I'm going to ask you to get into either groups of threes or twos in your row right now. This is the active part. So quickly find partners, introduce yourselves to one another. Okay. 
So the world, I'm going to use two pieces of open content um, to go through an exercise with you. So as you know, since you're Wikimedia, the internet is full of open content that we can actually use to help teachers develop kind of these skills in terms of deep learning. And I'm going to go through two examples with you. So this is an activity, um, this is a piece of content that was developed by the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. And basically what you're being asked to do in your team is you're going to come up with a definition for an imaginary geometric shape called a trianquad. And so you're going to do this by having me, or more specifically Galder, who is my co-presenter by the way, um, go through a series of examples and non-examples about what a tri and quad is. So in your teams, you're going to talk and discuss and hypothesize. And as we go through each example, you should be able with more and more precision to start defining what a tri and quad is. Now this gets a little bit long, so I'm going to try to push it through very quickly. But, um, whoops, can you go back first? Right. So um, if you go back, so you, once. So, um, all right, we'll leave it here. So this is a, this is a try and quad. So now I'm gonna ask you, you've seen it here, is this a try and quad? So talk with your group very quickly, and then we're gonna do this by whoever has the loudest voices. <laughs> okay, who says yes? Raise your hand if it's yes, it's a try and quad. Raise your hand if it's no. All right, the no's have it, so click no. And no, it's not a try and quad. Very good. How about this? Who's... Who says yes? Who says no? All right, the no's have it, so. Oh, by the way, you can't, you can't have dinner either. Um, how about the next one? Who says yes? Who says no? All right, I think the yeses have it. Yay. All right, you get the idea, keep going. Yes or no? Who says yes? No? All right, it's a yes. All right. No, I hear no. You can click. All right, very good. We'll keep going. I'm sorry, there's like 18 examples here. We have to go fast. Uh, <laughs> and we can't stop it. So, is this a try and quad? Yes? Very good. Keep going. Is this a try and quad? Who says yes? Who says no? Oh no, it's split. Oh God, I hate that. Um, if you give me money, I can actually um, make the vote go either way. Who says yes? No? I think the no's have it. Oh. All right. Um, is this a try and quad? Who says yes? Who says no? Oh, most of you, let's say no. All right, it's not a try and quad. How about this? 
All right, I hear no automatically, so let's see. No? Ah. We're messing with you. Okay, now how about this? Yes? All right, let's say yes. Man, you guys are like on a losing streak right now. There's only like four people in the room who are having dinner, and I'm one of them, and they're the other. Um, okay, how about this? Who says no? Who says yes? Hmm, that's not very good. Who says no? All right, that's better. No? All right, it's not a trying quad. All right, you've redeemed yourselves. How about this? No? Most of you say no. Let's try no. Very good. Whew. All right, just a few more. Yes? Who says yes? Who says no? Let's, I think it's the yeses have it, so it is a trying quad. All right. Yes? No? You've stopped work. I'm sorry, this is my fault. You've stopped working with your teams. You're all just going. Um, so talk with your team for a second. I see no. How about a yes? Who says no? Two guys, three guys in the back. Who says yes? Oh, most of you. We have to go with yes. It is a try and quad. Sorry, gentlemen. Um, is this? No, yes. How many say no? Who says yes? That's most of you. All right. Sorry, this does get long. We'll keep going. How about this one? No, yes. I see, I hear no's, so let's try no. Ah. Next one. Yes or no? Who says yes? Who says no? That's most of you. Let's say no. How about this one, Le? All right, that's no. Okay. So, this is what you've been waiting for. What is a try and quad? So I want you to talk in your groups now. You have to come up with a definition. Remember, if it's not correct, you don't eat dinner. <laughs> so what is a try and quad? And when you're ready, let me know. Who's ready? To Wait, are you looking up try and quad online? Oh, and you can't use your phones. What is a try and quad? Anybody? Anyone, anyone? Stop looking at your phone. <laughs> Third grade? No. <laughs> anyone? What's a, what's a try and quad? Anybody want to try a definition? Who wants to try a definition? All right, how about if you get extra food? Will you try a definition? Um, hello. Hi. I don't think we've actually come to an agreement about the shape, but about the definition, but I th think the definition is that we need to have a quadrilateral, a triangle, and they need to share at least one point. Verde, 
Yes, I think in English. So, okay, so you're saying a triangle is shapes the chair of vertex, one vertex. You're saying it's a quadrilateral and a triangle that share a point. Up, over here, I, sorry, I can't re reach you. We can shout. No, you can't. So, a uh, triangle in our group decision is like a one line can link uh, the shape. One, you, you can use one line to link all shape, uh, but this shape will have two partition of area. Uh, one area will have uh, four angles, the other area will have three angles. I think there's somebody over here. No? Anyone else? Any other? Anybody? So what's a, what is a triangle? If we take a look at our examples and non-examples, what are we comfortable saying? What are some basic things we know? So it sounds like uh, most people uh, agree that there, the number of sides that each shape has to have. Uh, four and three. Okay, so, and you can kind of guess that from the name, right? It's a trion quad, like triangle quadrilateral. Now, the, the point where we might be having differences is what's, that's part of the definition. What's the rest of it? I mean, you've, you've basically said it. And they share one vertex, or who are the math people in here? Where are you? Okay, a vertex is a point, right? Okay. Yeah, so a triangle quad is, it's, it's two geometric shapes, one's a quadrilateral, one's a triangle, and they share a common point. Now, we have some, I know we have some math controversies here, which is why I brought my triangle quad notes, um, but <clears throat> I, I think we'll skip those for now for the sake of dinner, and we'll move on, so we'll close the triangle quad and go back to the um, PowerPoint, the next, oh sorry, that's me, the next slide. So let me ask you about, I mean, this is just a silly little exercise, uh, but I want to ask, what did you just think of this approach? This is your chance to talk. You can say whatever you want. Anybody? What did you think of this exercise? Ridiculous, interesting. Somebody just said something. Who just spoke over here? Yes. Um, immersive. Okay. Anybody else? Model for learning. Can you say more? And I'll it's like a Galileo, deductive models. Deduction, I see a lot of, uh, and from them, I extract a rule. Okay, so yeah, the tool itself, if I understand you correctly, the tool is, I mean, this is, a, this, this is made by the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, so it's obviously an educational tool, and it's very didactic, and it's immersive. Um, so yeah, it's interactive, you're interacting with digital content. How does this promote deep learning? Especially those of you that passed the deep learning quiz. How does this promote deep learning? What were you doing? You were thinking, you were identifying, all right, this is or isn't a qu uh, try and quad, sorry, yes. I would just say that ideally students will get time to think about it for a minute uh, on their own and then they will think in pairs and discuss things in pairs and then in the wider group and then they will share what they came up with and then also maybe like use the other information from the other groups. Yeah, the approach would be much better. We're ha we have about 45 minutes and you have to be fed. Um, but um, yeah, so you know, you could extend this out. But we'll go back to the deep learning thing. So you were identifying information. What else were you doing? You were you were integrating your knowledge with this. What else were you doing? You were co-constructing information. Very important. I didn't let you do it well enough because we don't have a lot of time. But you should have been communicating, you're evaluating your strategies. I mean, this is just a simple example of deep learning using digital content. So the try and quad is a happy activity. Now, um, so I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself for a second. So 
what you did here essentially was you did inductive reasoning. Um, and I want to talk about that for a second because in school typically, and especially in things like mathematics, we don't do inductive teaching. We do deductive teaching. We give students the rule. And we say, this is the Pythagorean theorem. And then a worksheet, 30 examples to confirm the rule. The worksheets are all about deductive learning. Um, but what you did was inductive learning. So you made observations, like this is, OK, it looks like this, it has this. And then you began to see patterns or regularities within that information. So this you know, tri and quad seems like it has this and this. And then you began to hypothesize um, and come up with kind of general ideas or explore your hypotheses. And you finally came up with a theory or a definition. This is what a tri and quad is. Now, this is a very imperfect system here because we have such a short amount of time. But you engaged in really deep learning. You identified, you related information, you collaborated together around this information, you evaluated your ideas and strategies. And this is what we want to be doing more of with content, digital content, because it's so compelling, as you see. We want to be doing more of this with our teachers so they can do more of this with their students. So the try and quite is a happy activity. And it's also a very um, educational activity. The content is specifically educational. So let me take you now to a rather unhappy place and use content that is not specifically designed for education at all, but is really out of the social sciences. So this was an ad from 1964 in a US presidential election. This is actually the most famous ad in American political history. Um, I'm going to show it to you twice, and as you watch it, I'm going to ask you the first time, just watch it, and answer two questions. Think about two things. Number one, what's the message? And number two, what's the series of events that's happening here? So have any of you seen this before? This ad is called Daisy. Some of you would. All right. So we'll watch it the first time again. What's the message and what's the series of events? from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. I know how to show people a good time or what. Um, so it was very interesting to watch some of your faces because you kind of looked horrified. Um, so first of all, well, let's talk about what's the message? Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd, right? Or? You'll die, kind of heavy. Um, OK, now, what's the series of events? What happened? Second, third. OK, what is it? It was count from one to nine, and back count. So the little girl, what's she doing? She's counting, but what is she doing? Why is she counting? Pulling the leaves off a daisy. That's why it's called daisy. So she starts to pull them off. And then what happens? Sorry? She loses track. Yeah, she's not very, she, she has the same math skills I do, right? So she loses track. And then what happens? Yeah, she's very young. She can't count, obviously. So she's counting. Then what happens? Okay, so then all of a sudden there's a voice. Counting. 
right is the uh, still nuclear explosion. Yep, right. And then the voice comes on again and says, oh, then what happens? I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Then you hear another voice. Who's the other voice? Well, before the announcement, says, these are the stakes. Um, yeah, it's the voice of Lyndon Johnson, the man who's running for president, whose campaign made this ad. And then you're told, vote for Lyndon Johnson November 3rd, or you're going to die. So, all right, so that's, that's the conscious message. So I'm going to ask you to look at the ad again, but I want you to think about three things. First of all, this ad was only shown once and it was pulled off television. It was never shown again. Sorry? Understandably. That's my question. Why is this ad so powerful and horrifying? Because some of you looked horrified. Um, what did the designers of the ad do to make it so horrifying? What structures did they use? What elements did they what messages were they getting at? So that's what I want you to look at. So we've just covered the surface of it. Now I want you to dig a little deeper. How did they create something? What did they use? What did they do? What elements did they use? What strategies did they use that could be so horrifying that it was never shown again? So we'll watch it one more time. President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. In your this groups, has been a presentation oh, of can't. the library. Oh, sorry, and I should mention this is also open source content. This is from the US Library of Congress, which I'm sure Wikimedia you know, connects to, has relationships with, etc. So now, in your groups, what did they do to make this such a powerful, horrifying, frightening ad? What elements, what strategies? So talk in your groups just very quickly. Okay, so let's hear what you're thinking. So my question to you is what, so obviously, you know, people pay a lot of money to get political ads designed, so people know what they're doing. Um, the most powerful message of this ad is not the overt message. I mean, you could just make an ad and say, vote for President Johnson on November 3rd, or we'll have a nuclear war. But they, did, they went beyond that. 
So what makes this so powerful? What did the designers of the ad do? How did they get you? Hello. Well, uh, something that we no uh, we've noticed is that there is like these polarities, like the innocence of the girl is one uh, that pulls people like, oh, what's she doing? Why is she counting? What's going on? And then you have like the huge explosion on the other side and it comes like really fast and unannounced. So that's like the first visual point that you have. And also thinking a little more about the context. Uh, people from the United States have really strong vision of the family. So you have a little girl, but you aim for the parents that are going to vote. So it's kind of uh, calling them like, if you don't do it, your children don't have any future. So it's going to be like two decisions, or you either vote for President Johnson or you don't, you don't go out of home at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the one thing you're getting at is kind of this juxtaposition. Um, right, so let's hear other, these are great comments. Let's hear from others. Yeah. Hello, I think it's very psychological. I think it, it's all about negativity bias. For example, this is what you would get if you don't vote for President Johnson. Mm -hmm. Nuclear bomb and no education. Yeah. Dead, 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 dead. Dead and dead in the worst possible way, right? You don't die of a heart attack. You're going to die in a nuclear annihilation. Um, anybody else? Other? So what are, what, are the, what are these ad designers doing? What are they doing? What are they getting at? What's the emotion that they're trying to make you feel? Fear, fear. And you mentioned it earlier, so it starts out with a lot of juxtaposition. You have this innocent little girl who's so young. Her, she's beginning her life, she's counting. She can't even count, she's so young. And then you, you I used the word, but you implied it. Then what happens? Right next to that is a nuclear countdown. So you have innocence, and you have darkness and evil. So what other imagery do you have in this ad? Yes, sir, in the back. I don't know if I can reach you. Hello, I was wondering that the child is uh, portrayed from a low angle. You would expect that the opposite to show her as vulnerable and cute, but that isn't done. She is. Well, she is the problem here. She's the one who is incapable, who cannot count, who's actually destroying the flower. And I think uh, the makers of the ad want to make you associate her with the opponent of Mr. Johnson, of Mr. Goldwater, who is an irresponsible child. And you can trust him to be the president with the nuclear buttons. And then you have her looking upwards, like looking to God. And you know, all these religious uh, connotations with nuclear war, those are invoked, and God and children of God are dismantled, I suppose. Anybody want to give a comment on that? Any other comments? Yep. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, I think um, this is an obvious um, cock up as far as America was concerned here. But since then, they will learn to do it subliminally so that their message goes over day by day, quietly, quietly, without people realizing. So yes, this is blatantly wrong, but I think it happens hour after hour, coming over from CNN and other places, and films even, putting people in their places worldwide. And we as Wikipedians must be aware of those subliminal messages coming from places like America. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's a few things. I mean, we've gotten a little broad, but I would say there's definitely a religious connotation here. There's obviously subliminal messages coming here. Anybody else? Any elements that you saw? Yes. We'll take two more, and then I'll try to... I'm uh, I just wanted to expand on the previous idea that uh, the important m message is the voice. It's a deep... A uh, strong voice of some paternalistic figure, which can uh, yes, which, which can save everyone from nuclear explosion, and it's uh, associated with President Johnson, and I think it's a powerful message also. Yeah, I mean, really, that male voice is kind of God. I mean, most 
you know, we can argue about this, but in a lot of cultures, man, God is a man, um, if God has gender at all. Anybody else? Yes. Um, we have one more, comment, so I'll take you and then we'll take one here. Um, this is a controversial with uh, Rachel Carson, science friend, mm -hmm. and Lyndon Johnson had a, a, a discuss with her because uh, she is counting, and then um, uh, Rachel Carson, and the bomb is a uh, orange bomb. Um, the writer council said that this, this kind of bomb and this kind of use of TNT will, will kill all the birds and all the stuff and, and the nature. And there is a controversy with this announcement. So interesting you said orange because it's black and white. Yeah, although the image, it's all black and white, but yeah, this orange. Uh, this, we have one more comment over here, and I think I've, I ignored whoever it was. All right, last one, sir. So again, I'll go back to the question. I mean, my question's really not about broader issues. My question's about this ad. What, what structure and strategy will they use as a comparison? Yeah. So there's some, no, oh, that's really late. Uh, there's something in here that's weird to me in terms of like, modern thing. He talks about the going into the dark and loving each other rather than like going into the dark and building a big wall or something. That that like it's not about defense, it's about loving each other, which is like a strange concept in Well he says we must love each other yeah. or die. Yeah, so I mean I'm gonna conclude here and just say that I mean this is kind of a brilliant ad because the designers of the ad tapped into something that's very deep inside of all of us, and that's what psychologists talk about is archetypes. Every culture has archetypes, and every culture across the world has the same archetypes. We have archetypes of heroes. We have archetypes about death, about fear, about children, about the father, the mother. And they've tapped into this, and they've done it, and we'll go back to you, by juxtaposing light with darkness, heaven with hell, innocence with evil, you know, this beautiful kind of young, it's nature, it's an ideal, and then the destruction of nature. So what was happening in 1964 that made this so powerful? The Cold War, Vietnam, which was the US and, you know, it was all part of the Cold War, the Kennedy assassination in 1963, the nuclear Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Um, you know, Rachel Carson wrote The Silent Spring in 1962, so it may have had something to do with that. But there was a whole historical context for this um, that made this so powerful. I'm not gonna ask you here, because I think we're gonna run out of time in a minute, but what, um, I, you know, this again is, you know, if I structured the questions a little better, we could have a, and we had more time, you could have a much deeper and richer context, but you can see how an activity like this for a teacher, you could really set up a study of history, especially kids oftentimes don't understand history and they need to because sometimes you don't connect, you don't feel what people were feeling at a particular time, time period. So, um, how many of you are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy? I think a lot of you are. I mean, I've been using the taxonomy of deep learning because sometimes I find that's not one that people know very well. But Bloom's taxonomy, just very quickly, is um, Benjamin Bloom in 1956 created this taxonomy of learning where he talked about learning being some of the most basic, um, most basic information, like recalling something or comprehending it to what he referred to as higher level thinking. So the ability to apply information, analyze it, synthesize it, and evaluate it. And what we, we just did in this exercise was you went through a lot of Bloom's taxonomy. So I had you recall information, what happened and what was happening in 1964. I asked you about the ad, the structure, that's comprehension. We didn't apply, but you analyzed the ad you synthesized, which essentially means you came up with your own message, what you thought it would be, and you evaluated some of the strategies. And again, I think you use this kind of critical thinking, deep learning skills that we want our students and our teachers 
to have around. And, and the great thing about this digital content, it's so compelling that it can really involve teachers in these kind of discussions and learning. So, um, you know, I have a simple message here, which is the content's the easy stuff. We have to find good content. But obviously, if we want teachers to learn to use digital content well, we can't just focus on the content and the information. We have to focus on the experience, the instruction. And I would say, too, that we want to get the best, we have to try to get the best out of our teachers so that they can get the best out of their students. I mean, a lot of you have brought up issues tonight that for me are why this deep learning is so important. Because again, we want our students to be prepared, not just for university and the world of work, but to actually be active and informed and engaged and responsible and moral citizens. So, you know, what I would say here is that information is obviously important, but we need to go beyond the information to give teachers the kind of experiences that you yourselves said that you learn from. And one way to do that, I mean, there's many ways. There's projects, there's tasks, but what I did tonight in a short amount of period time is to give teachers not the answers, but give them the questions. Because it's with the questions that people can begin to explore and generate and identify and relate and evaluate, and that is the deep learning. So for all of us as teacher educators, that really means giving up control a little bit and not feeling like we have to give people information and answers, but that we can actually pose questions that help them to think. So, you know, I'll say that if we want to, I'll just conclude and say if we want to promote deep learning and we want to help teachers using expertise, um, help te teachers develop expertise, that something like a workshop is also not enough. And I don't know what Wikimedia can do here, but I'm going to conclude just by a quick little quiz and ask you which of these two professionals, the athlete, the professional athlete or the professional teacher, which one gets a better formation? A better preparation, better formation, better instruction, more assistance and help to be a good professional. Which one of these, a professional athlete or a professional teacher in your mind? How many of you say the athlete? How many of you say the teacher? Very few of you. I would agree. I mean, I think we spend more time developing the skills of our athletes than we do of our teachers. And this is what I would say to Wikimedia and to all of you, and again, this is something to talk about over dinner. I don't know if you can do this, I don't know if you're set up for this, but we have to start making long-term investments in teachers, not short-term investments. Workshops are great. They're good for modeling, like I've been doing, trying to do with you. But teachers need more than modeling. Once they've got that model, they need time to practice it and design for it and make mistakes over it. And the, and the best way to do that is with coaching and support. And that really signifies a kind of a long-term relationship. So I will conclude here. Um, I don't know where we are in time. Um, I hope we're on time. I will say thank you very much. And uh, we don't have any time left, do we? Oh, wait, 11. And what time is dinner? 11. Nope, you're going to dinner. Um, so I think we're done. And, and we can talk perhaps over dinner. All right. Or early.